So hello, everyone, and welcome to the Empowering Women podcast. This is the second episode in our series on gender wealth equity. Our first episode was completely powerful. If you've not listened to it, please go check that out. And I am absolutely pumped to continue our conversation on gender wealth equity. And this guest today has quite the career story to boot on top of it. So Julie Schatz is a certified financial planner and partner at Investors Capital Management in Menlo Park, California. However, she did not start her career in the financial services world. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Notre Dame. And she's worked for large chemical companies such as Hercules, Dexter Corp, Loctite, and Hinkle, for 20 years as a field engineer, installing automated equipment across the U.S. and Singapore, and then she did a little bit in technical sales. So I am so excited to dive in and learn more about Julie and her background. Welcome, Julie, to the podcast. Wow, it's so good to be here. So as I just shared, your background, while it's a little less traditional than other finance professionals, which as another fellow engineer, I selfishly love. So please share with our listeners a little about your story, including what brought you into the finance world. Uh, it was a uh, happenstance, I'm afraid. Okay. So, so um, you know, when you're 18, you are choosing a career mm. and, and it's, it's daunting to think that you know, that you know enough at 18 that you're going to choose something that you're going to do for the next 40 or 50 years. So I knew enough about myself to know that, okay, I needed at least two careers. So I was going to choose something for 20 years. All right. My father's a um, civil engineer and structural engineer. My older sister's a chemical engineer. Math has always been my favorite subject. Mm. So it was somewhat comfortable for me to choose mechanical engineering. Um, Extra benefit is because engineering tends to be a male dominated field, I figured the salaries would be a bit better as well. So, I mean, that that all went into the calculation. And again, I'm choosing this for 20 years. Okay. Um, And it was fabulous, right? I loved engineering and uh, yeah, I mean, I I had a great time um, installing equipment all over the country. Um, but the whole time I was looking for what that next 20 years was going to be. Mm. And for a while I considered architecture because it, that, that's a combination of kind of art and technical. Mm. But when my husband and I got married, the way his family managed money scared the daylights out of me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was really not, not comfortable there. And, uh, so like within months of us getting married, I made an appointment for us to meet with a financial planner. Um, and I thought it was important, right? You know, I wanted to make sure that we were in sync, that we're working in the same direction together, right? And it, Smart it did, move. <laughs> it, it did that. It, it, it really was a good move, frankly. Yeah. It was, it was a good move. And then shortly, shortly afterwards, you know, Pete had no interest in going to these meetings. So I would go to these meetings with the financial planner. And then I realized I liked the other side of the table. And so, you know, it's in the back of my mind. And, uh, you know, we get to be later 30s and it looks feasible to actually do a career change because a career change is not insignificant, right? Mm -hmm. I have to forego my salary. And so, okay, but, yep. but it was feasible. And so I took my financial planner out for lunch and quizzed him about what he would have done differently and everything. And I interviewed some other financial planners and then I just took a dive in and I, I signed up for my first class. I was doing night, night classes um, and I was hooked from the first class. Hmm. Um, and then I got lucky timing, timing wise towards the end of my coursework. I got laid off. Now, ordinarily, oh wow, you might might be bummed, right? But no, you know that part in Shrek 
where where the donkey is jumping up pick me pick yeah, me pick take me. me that yeah. was me pick me pick you're like me. oh you're having a layoff can i go please <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. because i had been with the company for 10 years so my layoff was seven months paid leave plus medical and it's, it was just that kick just that push that i needed to actually complete this career change so i finished my classes studied for my CFP exam, took my CFP exam, and then you got to find a job. (laughs) (laughs) You know, work and then you got to start doing that again. Yeah. (laughs) And, and so I went from being employed, being from an employee to being self-employed. Um, and, and that in and of itself is a whole story, right? You know, when you're self-employed that first year was negative. I had more expenses than income. Now, thankfully, it wasn't tremendously negative. And I think it was just the first year that was negative. You know, it gets a tiny bit better every year until it starts getting way better yeah. every year. Um, but yeah, so that's how it happened. That, that is crazy. <laughs> so literally your marriage and and maybe your, I'm going to call it your husband's process, for lack of a better word, for managing money wasn't quite ex- up to your expectations. So you're like, let's let's get some way to help us, you know, an objective third party. And then you're like, huh, I kind of like what they do. Maybe I should try what they do. It's funny how uh, serendipitous life can be sometimes. That is fabulous. And, and, and scary. I mean, to make that level of a career change, you know, what, 20 years into your career, that's, that's scary. (laughs) So, and that's also where the planning helped out, right? The planning and the saving helped put me in the place to be able to do that career change. Be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, obviously you're in the, in the financial services industry now. Tell us a little bit more about your role at investors, man, capital management. Just curious what you do. Sort of what does a day in the life of look like? Oh, <laughs> a day in the life of, all right. One of the things I love about this career is that my days are not the same. They're never mm-hmm. the same. Uh, you know, we're a small company. It's myself uh, and one business partner, Jennifer Cray, and we are owners and partners. And then we have two support staff, Nikki and Katie. And so there's four of us. And when when it's four people running a business, you end up doing everything. You know, mm. like we do have a bookkeeper, but someone's got to check that, which yep. is me. We do have a CPA to do our tax return, but someone's got to check that, and that's me. Um, and then we have our 401k plan. Oh, but what do I do day in, day out? Um, we're towards the end of tax season. Mm. And so much of my time over the past weeks has been tax reviews for clients. Mm. So, you know, the tax process, tax process in the USA. Oh, my God. I know. I feel like you need to get a PhD in tax to be it, able to, to it, figure it, it out. <laughs> It really doesn't have to be as bad as what we do. Yeah. But, but we have made it so bloody complicated. Yeah. And, you know, the, the CPAs uh, and tax preparers, they have this small window where they've got to prepare hundreds and hundreds of tax returns and mistakes are bound to be made. And, sure. and frankly, you know, oftentimes I know more about my client's stuff than the than their CPA. So we review nearly all of our clients' tax yep. returns before they're filed, just to find those mistakes before they're filed so you don't have to do an amended yep. return. Sometimes they're tiny. Sometimes they're really clean tax returns. Yep. And sometimes they're big mistakes. So, oh, so what are areas maybe you specialize in? Are there certain areas that you and the company specialize in? Uh, tax plan. Tax planning is my specialty. It's one of my favorite areas. Okay. <laughs> it was my favorite class going through the CFP program. I, I mean, think about it taxation for personal financial planners how freaking boring does that sound <laughs> i loved that class love the teacher love the class and it's it's always been my favorite and it's it, it we- is tough if you're a lay person like me <laughs> i consider myself at least average intelligence and i i typically do my own taxes unless it's just uber complicated which it's not yet but i had some complicating factors this year and I had like I had the internet open I look like a mad scientist in here I had crap everywhere trying to figure it out okay, so I, I could get it yeah I'm sure you, you have a, a lot of folks come to you for help 
feel free to reach out to me if you need a hand. Yeah. If you have a question <laughs> next time. Okay. Um, yeah, tax planning. And then in the fall, that is our year end tax planning. We do a lot of Roth conversions with okay. people. So I don't know, you know, you know the difference between your IRAs, there's the traditional yep. IRA and rollover IRA yep. and your 401k. Those are all tax deferred. Yeah. That's the Roth IRA, which is tax free. And so at the end of the year, I'm doing, I'm looking at clients year end tax estimates to see, is there room to do a tax efficient Roth conversion? And oh yeah. It makes sense. Like that. Yep. Hmm, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But, and then there's always the investment planning and the retirement planning and kids school to pay for. And okay. Yeah. yeah. I can see that. Yeah, I can see both of those. Yeah. That That's tough on a family. If you're trying to save for retirement and then you've got two or three kids and you want to help them with their college, that's, that's tough to balance and, and the daily bills that come in. Yes. In fact, that is, um, that's, Retirement dollars and kids' college dollars are the same dollars. They're competing. Yeah, with and one another. Yep. Yes. And I often have to tell clients that your child can borrow money for college, but you cannot borrow money for retirement. Mm, and you point. can't sacrifice your retirement. And not that I want. I mean, I don't want this child to spend too much for college either. You know, going into debt for college, boy. I mean, I had a um, an ER doc come see, come see me, and he's, I still see him all the time. Um, and when he came to see me, he had two hundred and forty thousand dollars of student loan debt. Oh. I know, I know, I know. And you, and you're, you're, oh, that makes it, me want to deep breathe. Okay. I know you, you just sink inside. You're like, what a oh. burden. And, and, and this kind of, you know, to think that we do this to our yes. young people. Yeah. Well, speaking of your clients, obviously our, our, many of our listeners are female. Obviously we, we do have some wonderful male allies out there, but what differences do you see between your female and male clients when it comes to your conversation? Okay, you might be surprised, but I'm not sure. I see big differences between my male versus female clients. Um, I'll give you an idea of my client base. 20% of my clients are gay or lesbian. Okay. 50% are heterosexual couples. 20% are widows. Hmm. So the kind of gives the, the range and then there's you know a bunch of single people okay um and then when it comes to couples usually one person in a couple takes the lead regarding finances you know it's a division of duties right not, yep why should everyone why should both people do everything that kind of defeats the purpose of <laughs> being a <laughs> couple right, right? right? yeah yeah <laughs> um and so the person more interested is the more engaged person. And 60% of the time, that is the woman. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like a 60-40 split for my client base. Um, but in terms of the conversations, you know, I was, I was thinking about it. And yeah, I, I don't, you know, and possibly it's because my clients self-select, right? Right. Clients, clients get to choose who they work with. Then, yep. frankly, it goes both ways. I get to choose who I work with. Right. So maybe you might a... see a red flag and say, "Not for me." <laughs> yep. Yeah, and, and and likewise for them. Like, I do not have a large. Um, I don't have big spending clients. Okay. Right, and and I tend to have. I tend to have low maintenance clients. That's good. <laughs> I mean, and it's not that. Things don't pop up. Of course, yeah. things pop up. Yeah. But like, I don't have a client where there's always something. <laughs> yeah, sure. Right? Yep. Yeah. Is there any like a common question women ask or that you find that women are traditionally more interested in? Uh, the, the one thing I've never seen in a man is I've never seen a guy afraid of being a bag lady <laughs> in their <laughs> older age, which and oh, funny. <laughs> I know. And I have this, this one, this one client who truly she could I know she she used to have hopefully she doesn't anymore but she she used to have that fear 
And yet she has more assets than she could ever spend. And hopefully I've convinced her of that at this point. And forgive me, I forgot your question already. <laughs> no, you're good. I was asking you other questions that women typically ask. And you said not generally. Uh, um, your client uh, is the one who's worried about becoming poor destitute. <laughs> I, I can say funny enough. So most of the listeners know that my my mom lives with me because my dad passed a few years ago. And I think she has that same that same fear um, of being, I don't know if she uses the term bag lady, but I get it, like of not having the money to to do what she needs to do, take care of her health and such. So I think that's a probably a pretty common fear. Yes. I, I think women are more concerned about, am I going to be okay in retirement? Am, hmm, interesting. am, am I going to make it? At, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because there definitely is a wealth gap between women and men. There's differing numbers on the subject. Obviously, it's a pretty hard thing to calculate. Obviously, we know that pay gap is a part of that, although the Caucasian women are really rapidly uh, getting even with men, um, women of color, particularly back Black women and Latin Latinx women, not, not as much. But where do you see barriers in closing that gap for women, the wealth gap? Okay, there's two different sides of that question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so generally for for all women and frankly all, all, all people, too many companies don't reward their good employees with mm. raises and bonuses. In other words, you know, if you've been an employee for five years, the, the company, the company may not feel the need to um, extend that raise and bonus that maybe you deserve. Right. So this is where looking at, and some states are now requiring companies when they post a new job position, they have mm. to post a range. Yep. I know California and New York, but I know there's several other states also. And so it's getting a little bit more competitive information out there. Yep. Um. You know, so you do have to be your advocate. You've got to be your advocate. The burden. Yeah, it, falls, it's funny falls that you, you say that. I literally just got a T-shirt that says "Know Your Worth." I should have worn it today. Oh, <laughs> yes, 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 yep. yes, yes. Oh my gosh! Um, and I have watched my daughter fight for pay, and it's impressive because I don't. She is an introvert. I'm clearly an extrovert. I don't think I could have done that when I was her age. She is 24, 25, and I have watched her fight for pay. In fact, and the way she did it, she, um, you know, she had, she had started. Um, and so she was making a couple friends and she was asking about what they, she actually asked them. You know, she wanted to know what range and, and her male colleague just told her what he was, what he was making. And she was appalled at how low it was, honestly, because she was going to ask for more. So she did get more and then she got him a raise too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think if, if this were my daughter speaking, she'd say, advocate for yourself. Even if you don't think you deserve it, or if you think other people deserve it more, go for it. Because there's so much data that shows, shows that women tend to underestimate or undervalue what their skills are worth. Um, so it's really important to talk yourself up, even if you're afraid that there's some imposter syndrome. You know, there's plenty of incompetent people that we know of who get ahead and, and you shake your head. So just well, know, and, and know I, you deserve it. But my thought is you're always going to learn something out of that conversation. So even if you don't get what you were hoping or all or part of what you were hoping, you kind of learn where the part your employer stands on the matter. And that can help inform what you do or don't want to do. Yeah. So on the larger issue of careers and wealth gaps, you know, I mean, this is, this is going to sound really bad to, to say, but, you know, choose careers that pay well. I, I don't know that sounds bad to say yeah. because, and, and it's not that like teachers and nurses, which are traditionally 
uh, female positions, they actually pay quite well. You can you can earn really well with great benefits, teaching yep. and nursing. In fact, there's such a shortage of nurses that they're in they're in super high demand. Yep, especially after the pandemic, I think a lot of people in that mm-hmm. field were like, "I can't take exactly. anymore." Yep. The other thing is CPAs, certified public accountants, are in serious demand. There's a shortage. The IRS I did not wants, know that. The IRS wants to hire a bunch, and they're going to have trouble finding. Yeah. So there's uh, fields where we really need people that pay well. Yep. Uh, the um, Department of Labor has a good website for researching some of this too. Okay, that's a good note. That's a good note. I'll have to make that note, make a link in the the show notes because I think many of us, while you definitely want to pursue something you love and you're passionate, I think you also yes. need to understand the financial implications of the the what you're thinking about doing because it yes. will. I think what I'm learning probably a little bit later in life than I should have learned it is that it impacts your ability to. I say walk in your purpose and joy. So my aha moment, and I don't, Julie, you probably don't know this because we just met, but one of the reasons I went down this road is what I didn't consider was I obviously went down an engineering path. I kind of knew it paid pretty well when I went in, but I have to admit I didn't spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about it. And then I actually, as many of our listeners know, I'm, I'm currently in a rental and I'm building a, a new home. And it was the first time I had rented in a long time. And when I got in here, there were things that were broke. The owner fixed some of them, but he wouldn't fix other things. The Uh, air conditioner went out. There was just a whole host of issues. uh, And some of them I had to spend my own money on. And it really made me take a step back of if I hadn't taken the steps that I had taken, had been able to progress and the companies that I had progressed in and done pretty well financially. I would be in a spot where I couldn't do the things that I am blessed to be able to do. So I had this aha moment of where, what career you pick matters, how you progress matters. And it matters yeah. in not just how much money is or isn't not in your retirement account or bank account, but it, what it allows you to do with your life, which is yeah. how I got here. So I, yeah. I definitely agree. I'm, it's, I'm, very passionate about uh, women in STEM. So, I, you know, obviously the STEM fields as a whole uh, tend to pay more than, than others. And so it's one of the things I've tried to bring home to, to folks that listen to this podcast is really think about it. STEM may stink. And if you, if you hate math and science, it's probably not, not the career for you. Aww. But <laughs> if it might be, then just think about like what, what it could offer you longer term. Yeah. So you had mentioned specifically uh, women of color. Yep, correct. Yep. Okay. So, I mean, it goes without, you know, I think it just goes without saying that, of course, there's additional barriers for women of color. Yep. Um, And part of it would be exposure to various careers, right? Oh, yeah. Good point. When you're 18, what are you exposed to? Like, I, I don't know, even know if financial planning was a career back then. <laughs> you know, I, I had no exposure to it. I, I didn't, to be really honest. <laughs> right. And, and there's so many careers like that. There's so many careers that we have no exposure to. So part of it is exposure to careers to re- to think, oh, well, I think I could do that. So so there's there's part of that, right? Because I had my dad was an engineer, my sister's an engineer. So it was familiar. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. So I had, um, I hope I get her name right, Abby Okalewe on on our podcast um, about, I think it was uh, season three, but she talked about, it's not only the individual or the child or the young young person, it's actually their, whoever their guardians are, their parents or, you know, whoever their guardians are, because what she, when in the world, that, the work that she does with raising smart girls, she talks about not only educating the girls themselves, but on educating the the caregivers because they they have no idea. So they they came encourage these children oh. to go find those type of careers or at least dabble in it to see if it's of interest because they don't know about it. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's uh God. So you know, I mean, social work is a it's it's a it's a heart. It's a it's a it's a 
it takes a lot of heart to do social work, but yeah. it doesn't pay as well as it damn well should. No, and so it it's, frust- it's frustrating. So you sure as heck can't take a lot of student loans if you want to do st- if yeah. you want to do uh, social work. However, I have found that our community colleges are an, a s- wonderful resource and underappreciated. Yeah. Anyhow, um, it, and so, the women of color in your client base, do you see anything else that might be barriers for them? Okay, so this is going to be sad, but I have no women of color in my in my client base, which is so that tells you there's a barrier in seeking yeah, financial yes. planning. So either not knowing it's available, not being able to afford the services of a financial planner, any of that. Um, yep. Yeah, I do some pro bono stuff with some families and things like okay. that. Yeah. Anything that stands out to you from that pro bono work? Um, okay. Um, this, this is going to be, all right, here we go. <laughs> You're good. We talked tough on this. We talked about some tough subjects on this one. <laughs> okay. I, I really... We all, each of us, has to become comfortable in our own skin. We have to be comfortable with who we are and what we can do. Because if we're comfortable in our own skin with who we are, then we're less likely to feel the need to try to keep up with the Joneses or some mm. social media influencer. We're, we're not buying things to try to satisfy some lack of discontent within ourselves. 